an oil tanker truck catches fire in Lagos, killing nine people and burning 54 other vehicles. Burma joins South Sudan, China, Russia, North Korea, Libya and others as the worst offenders in the world for human trafficking and forced labor. And raising awareness of sickle cell anemia through fashion. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. We begin tonight in Nigeria, where emergency services are clearing burnt vehicles after an oil tanker truck caught fire in Lagos on Thursday. Nine people died in the blaze that also destroyed 54 other vehicles. Officials say four people were rescued. Their injuries are being treated in hospital. According to the Federal Road Safety Commission, the crash happened near Otedola Bridge on a section of the road heading out of Lagos. The commission, break, uh, the commission said brake failure seems to have caused the accident. The tanker, five buses, two trucks, a tricycle, and 45 cars were burnt out. Meanwhile, a massive fire at a market in Kenya's capital, Nairobi, has left 15 people dead and more than 70 others injured. Rescue officials say the blaze ripped through several stalls at Kikomba Market. Nine people were killed at, at the scene. Six others died in hospital. Authorities say the fire likely started in a timber yard. The bodies were also recovered from a nearby six-story building. It's believed they died after inhaling toxic fumes. It took firefighters close to two hours to keep the blaze from spreading to adjacent buildings. Traders are also counting uh, the cost of the fire. Some say they have lost most of the investment. Authorities are now considering demolishing the, presidential, uh, the residential building damaged by the fire to avoid repairs. Well, the U.S. State Department has released the latest annual trafficking in persons report and it shows Myanmar has joined the ranks of South Sudan, China, Russia, Syria, Iran, North Korea, Venezuela and others as the worst offenders in the world for human trafficking and forced labor. But the State Department has also recognized 10 heroes, among them Africans, who have dedicated their lives to ending the scourge of modern slavery. VOA's diplomatic correspondent Sidney Sain has more from Washington. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was joined by presidential advisor Ivanka Trump to release the State Department's annual Trafficking in Persons report. He had bad to news to relay damage. on Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. In Southeast Asia, Burma's armed forces and others in the Rakhine state dislocated hundreds of thousands of Rohingya and members of other ethnic groups, many of whom were exploited through the region as a result. Some in the Burmese military also recruited child soldiers and subjected adults and children from ethnic minority groups to forced labor. Pompeo also singled out Libya, North Korea and Iran as among the worst offenders, saying Iran punished victims of trafficking instead of the perpetrators. Francisca Awamambuli. But the ceremony also honored 10 heroes dedicated to ending human trafficking, who have often put their own lives at risk. Awa Mbuli from Cameroon experienced modern slavery herself. When I arrived at the Gulf Cooperation Council, there wasn't a job teaching English. I was trafficked into slavery as a domestic worker, where I didn't earn anything but inhuman treatment and sexual abuses. When I said that I wanted to go home, they told me that I had a debt of 3,000 US dollars, which I had to pay, and then pay my flight back home. This was a lie. She now leads programs to economically empower women who are survivors of human trafficking in Cameroon. Another Hero Award winner said everyone can do their part to fight human trafficking by being a conscientious consumer. In many cases, I found that uh, the companies uh, has been complicit in human trafficking in their supply chain. So we can put pressure on the company by saying that I do not want by the tainted product. Kim Young chul has exposed forced labor conditions in South Korea and globally, particularly of migrant fishermen. Cindy Sane, VOA News, Washington. 
But the U.S. State Department says many African countries are doing a better job combating modern slavery. More than a dozen African nations received upgrades in the report. Joining us here in studio is Maurice Middleburg. He is the executive director of the non-profit organization Free the Slaves. Maurice, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you, Vincent. It's a pleasure to be here. It, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Now, as we have seen, uh, we just mentioned that Africa has kind of gotten some credit for fighting this. In fact, for many people, they can't even fathom the idea that it's mm -hmm. modern slavery. Uh, where are the improvements and in which countries would you say things are still bad? Well, uh, as you say, there's a dozen countries uh, who have really done very well and clearly have uh, upgrades. I would point to the example of Ghana, which has done particularly well. And in part, that's attributable to the Child Protection Compact that Ghana has signed with the United States of America and the financial and technical support and the cooperation between the two countries. So it's a very good example of how progress is possible. Now, there were downgrades for Gabon and for South Africa, and the contrast between them is quite striking because what it tells us is that this is a choice, that uh, the developed world and the African countries have a choice to make about whether they want to rigorously pursue the eradication of slavery or, frankly, be complicit or negligent in it. And that's what this report really demonstrates. Now, let's face it. Uh, there are people in Africa who may look at the title uh, and perhaps the organization and say, free the slaves. Like, who is... So who is selling slaves? I mean, my country does not trade in slaves. Can we break it down? What amounts or what constitutes slavery or trafficking of humans? Okay, so first to say that every country in the world is afflicted with slavery. So this is not particularly about Africa. It is a phenomenon that's present everywhere, including the United States. And what we mean by slavery is that people, through force or fraud or coercion, are being held at a workplace or in a place of sexual exploitation for economic exploitation. This is an economic crime where somebody is stealing their labor. So they're using violence, they're using threat, they're using menace in order to have people work, be it in a factory, a farm, a mine, or a brothel, in order to steal all the profit from their work. Now, there are cases, though, where even families may offer their own daughter or son to another family. Uh, how do you help this understand that this is uh, a form of slavery and it's not acceptable, even if there is a consent uh, from the, the consent from the side of right. the parents? Right. Well, so multiple variants of the problem you just described. There's the problem of forced marriage, uh, where girls, often quite young girls, are basically given to pay off a debt uh, or to otherwise. Uh, satisfy an obligation that they have to some other uh, party. And that really then has to do with the poverty and vulnerability of the family that does that. It also has to do with gender discrimination and the rights of children. Because when there are norms that do not value women and girls, when there are norms who, that treat children as property rather than as beings with intrinsic rights, all of those are what make women, girls, and children particularly susceptible to being trafficked. Yes. Now, in, in the case of, uh, for example, uh, the practice of uh, a, a very commonly used word in many African countries mm -hmm. is a house help or a maid. Right. Uh, can, can, can people also see that as a form of uh, slavery, even when it looks like they're actually employing these young kids? Well, look, here's the thing to understand about modern slavery. It often looks normal. It's not in the days where people were literally in shackles and it was manifest that they were in slavery. Often they just look like they had a job on a farm, on a mine, in a household. But it's the condition of that employment where the, the household help that you just described, what we would call domestic servitude, the person is being really held there against their will through threat, through violence, uh, through coercion of their family, and not receiving any payment. They're basically enslaved within the household, and this is really quite common. Now, how do you resolve this problem in countries uh, such as the DRC, where part of uh, the contributing factor to the, 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 the problem festering is actually conflict? Right. So we actually have a program. We Free the Slaves have a program in eastern Congo and north and south uh, Kivu where we've actually made quite significant progress in the communities in which we work. These are the communities where mining takes place, particularly artisanal, informal mining, and uh, people get into debt or they're otherwise coerced by, mal by militias. But what we have learned how to do is to build collective community resistance to slavery 
by educating people, mobilizing people, working with local authorities, working with local religious leaders, and actually communicating with militia leaders, we in fact have been able to make significant progress in those communities in which we have programs. So again, the message here is progress is possible. It's a question of making the necessary investments and making the right choices. In the countries you work in, say the DRC and other African countries, mm -hmm. do they have like legislation at the national level or even local governments where at least it's clear that it's illegal to do this. Yes, uh, slavery is illegal now in every country in the world. It is, there is no longer any country which provides a legal sanction. The problem is more about the implementation and enforcement of what's in the law. Because the reality is those laws are often in the, on the books. They're there in theory and in principle, but they're not actually being implemented. And again, it comes back to this issue of will the necessary investments and choices be made by the governments? And what we find is that there's great laxity in this. And you see it in the very minimal number of arrests and prosecutions that are made for modern day slavery. And there you have the, the problem. Well, we hope this goes away someday. Thank you for joining us. It's and been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. That's very Appreciate kind. It. Certainly. Well, Norris Middleburg is the executive director of Free the Slaves. Thank you very much. European Union leaders reached a deal early Friday morning on migration. French President Emmanuel Macron said the agreement was a Euro European cooperation. We are not an island, and we must be able to face up to this challenge while remaining loyal to our values and protecting our people and national cohesion. Tonight, we took an important step. Many predicted the impossibility of an agreement. Many predicted triumph of national solutions. Tonight, we have succeeded in finding a European solution, a way of working in cooperation. Thank you. Well, the deal establishes reception centers for migrants and asylum seekers in EU member states that are willing to take them in. Italian Premier Giuseppe Conte says Italy will decide later whether it will host any of those reception centers. EU leaders plan to establish screening facilities in northern African countries to help, uh, help stem the flow of people crossing the Mediterranean to get to Europe, often through Italy. As yet, no African country has agreed to host a screening post. EU leaders hope to entice them with aid money. Arrivals to the continent have dropped sharply since the migration crisis peaked in 2015, creating deep divisions among the EU's 28 member states about how to respond. Some countries promoted more open-door policies, but others set up, uh, set up barriers to prevent those who reached Europe from crossing their borders. Now, a contingent of 160 police officers from Rwanda has been deployed to South Sudan's capital, Juba, for a one-year peacekeeping mission under the United Nations mission in South Sudan. The unit is made up of 80 men and 80 women. It is the first female-led contingent from Rwanda based in the country. The peacekeepers will be stationed in Juba, but may be deployed elsewhere in the country if, if and when needed. Members will work at uh, the peacekeeping mission's protection sites in Juba, set up for displaced people who are seeking shelter. It will be a good thing to women for this, the community of South Sudan, but even for women all over the world, because they will know that women can do anything. When she's empowered, she can do anything as a, as a man. Well, the new contingent is also expected to help women and children who have suffered most in South Sudan's conflict. Fighting has rumbled on in the country since civil war erupted there at the end of 2013, just two years after independence. Well, want to know what you think about Africa 54 and uh, what and uh, the stories that uh, we cover? We have a conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. You're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince Corey. Still to come on Africa 54, rising, uh, raising health uh, awareness through fashion. But first, a look at Friday's headlines. In Nigeria, an oil truck catches fire on a road between Lagos and Ibadan, killing nine people and setting dozens of other cars on fire. 
In Kenya, 15 people are dead and 70 others injured as fire sweeps through the Gikamba market and nearby apartments and shanties in Nairobi on Thursday. In Ivory Coast, the Climate Change Africa 2018 summit begins in Abidjan with the goal of outlining roadmaps to climate stability adapted to different African territories. In Mozambique, the town of Masingia develops a reputation as a hub for illegal game hunting in the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area. Finally, in Senegal, supporters of the soccer national team express disappointment after it's eliminated on a tiebreaker from the World Cup. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses have a long history of being persecuted around the world. The activities are banned or restricted in several countries. They are considered an extremist organization in Russia, while their members are imprisoned in South Korea and Eritrea. Viewers Anush Avetisnyan has the story. Hello, we are asking Russian speakers one question. Should people listen to the advice of the Bible? No. <laughs> This is New York State, where the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses is located in the town of Warwick. Bible education work. From here, the Witnesses direct the preaching of their beliefs and track the violation of their members' rights in various countries. These buildings, like the organization's other offices, are known as battles and are operated by volunteers known as battle families. So this is the area where the dining room is. Life in a battle resembles that of a commune. Jehovah's Witnesses live and work here and eat together at a canteen. The building has everything its residents may need, from a dentist's office to a dry cleaners and hairdressers. And though technically everything is free, battle families still pay for what they get by foregoing a number of rights and freedoms. For example, they are not allowed to have children. And you go through times maybe that, you know, the desire to have, a, have children is stronger. But at this point in our lives, um, we're focusing on, you know, our work here, educating. Uh, promoting Bible education um, among Jehovah's Witnesses in the worldwide field. Jehovah's Witnesses have about eight and a half million members in 120,000 congregations worldwide. They call themselves true Christians, but Witnesses worship Jehovah and not Jesus Christ. They don't recognize the Holy Trinity, don't worship the cross or celebrate Christian holidays. They are known for questioning traditional reading of the Bible and having repeatedly predicted Armageddon. The most controversial religious belief of witnesses is refusal of blood transfusion, even under threat of death. This belief has led to many deaths that could have been prevented. My family was just faced with that situation where we had to make a decision, uh, my wife, whether she would accept a blood transfusion or not. And she decided not to do that and she sought alternative methods. Such beliefs have led to opposition, at times harsh from communities and governments around the world. In Russia, the organization is considered extremist and banned. In the U.S., there are over one million members of Jehovah's Witnesses known as ministers who teach the Bible. They learn foreign languages with one purpose, to preach. Hi. Hi, привет. Did you download the brochure, Who are Jehovah's Witnesses? Door-to-door -door preaching is a priority for Jehovah's Witnesses. That is how they try to spread the word of God and their interpretation of the Bible. They rehearse and perfect the art of preaching during meetings like this. They also teach their children to preach from a very early age. I started preaching when I was five, but I was going from door to door with my parents much earlier than that. Literature used for preaching in Bible studies is printed in 10 major plants that export to other countries. One of the largest ones is located in Wallkill, New York, an hour drive away from the headquarters. Here, witnesses publish their main magazine, The Watchtower. Jehovah's Witnesses say they are not planning to stop what they are doing. Despite being ostracized and misunderstood, they continue to preach and spread their beliefs every day. Once again, I'm working. In that case, we can come some other time. No, I'm not interested. Anusha Vitisyan, VOA News, New York State.
Welcome back to Africa 54 and here's what's trending. The day the ban on women driving was lifted, Saudi, fa Saudi fashion designer Eman Johadji and three friends drove to Jada's uh, seafront and exchanged their car for bicycles. Their colorful embroidered jumpsuit of abayas stood out among the sea of women in black. But one, uh, no one stopped them. Now there is even a new outfit for driving, topped with a hoodie to cover the hair, tight at the elbows so the sleeves do not get caught on the steering wheel, and shorter on the sides to make it easy to switch pedals. Most importantly, for jo Johadi, uh, there is no trace of black. Well, next up, uh, Amazon.com says it will offer incentives to entice entrepreneurs to set up their own small package delivery businesses as part of Amazon's latest effort to solve the challenge of getting goods the last mile to customers' doorstep. The new program promises more competition for delivery companies like United Parcel Service and FedEx. Amazon says qualified entrepreneurs could start businesses with as little as $10,000, although that does not include the cost of hiring drivers. Well, and finally, international hit military science fiction video game, Hello, is coming to television in the form of a scripted drama series on the cable channel Showtime. Uh, the 10-piece uh, episode series, uh, based on the best-selling Xbox franchise, will dramatize the 26th century conflict between humanity and an alien threat known as the Covenant. It will also weave personal stories with action and adventure. Hello is a first-person shooter game developed for Microsoft Core's Xbox in 20. 2001. It has grown into a global phenomenon, selling more than 77 million copies worldwide and grossing more than $5 billion in sales. And that's what's trending today. Now, rising NBA star Jeremy Grant and designer Ife Oma Onya are launching our generation, a cool and relaxed fashion collection for very tall young men. This Midsummer Madness fashion show brought uh, an NBA players to the Washington area with a shared goal of fighting sickle cell anemia. Our red carpet reporter, Myra Fernandez, was there. We are in the DC area, Maryland to be exact, where designer Ifeo Maonia and NBA player Jeremy Grant revealed the basketball stars first clothing collection. This is a CrossFit gym in the middle of a storage center with a very industrial look. It's the perfect venue for the cool Rebel clothing line that includes ripped jeans and patterned shirts and jackets. But what drove the 24-year-old basketball player to the fashion world? You can look at any little thing, uh, honestly, and, and, and find uh, morals and, and, and artistic views from it. Um, the, the, the work ethic you, you, you have to put in, um, the time you have to put in is, is similar to the time you have to put in the basketball to, to, to be as good as you want to be. And there was a time when finding clothes for a six foot eight young man wasn't easy, which is also why he chose to be a designer. It was definitely tough finding clothes. Um, my entire family um, obviously played basketball, so we was extremely tall. Um, often got hand-me-downs and things like that. So. Uh, that's definitely, that's definitely one of the reasons uh, why, why I wanted to create. Inside the gym, there was plenty of support for the new designer whose inspiration comes from almost everywhere. His dad and uncle were among the audience and his brothers and childhood friends didn't miss his first runaway show. NBA star Victor Oladipo from the Indiana Pacers showed his support. I had the pleasure and the honor of growing up with the Grant brothers, uh, Jeremy, Jaron, Jalen, and Jere, and uh, Jeremy is here having his, his uh, uh, shooting his first fashion show for his line. Um, and, you know, I just came back to support him. When we sat to talk with the Thunders player, the room was already filled with excitement as people were ready to check out his designs. And Jeremy was calm, wearing his own brand, a black shirt partly sprinkled with paint, looking almost like a mistake, but purposely done, along with ripped black pants a scarf on his wrist, and a hat. The fashionista shows Ifeo Maonia from Cleopatra Couture to work on his collection. I met with her early, uh, just about getting clothes made for me personally, and uh, our relationship kind of just blossomed into um, being able to create something uh, for my line. Um, 
She's just great. She, she kind of took me in. I, I met Jeremy's mom. I designed for her for her 50th. And Jeremy had seen my collection and reached out to me to design for him, for his personal use. And from having conversation, I found that he had the same passion that I did. He's artistic and his sketches. So I was like, hey, we can collaborate and I can help you bring your dream to life. And that's how we started. The Nigerian designer, Ifioma Onya, or Ifi, like she likes to introduce herself, study fashion in London, lives in the DC area, and she's sure there's more than space for African designers and fashionistas to place their mark in US fashion and trends. And my design, my tagline is Fashion Without Borders. I've incorporated the three continents that I grew up in, Europe, Africa, and the US. If he wants to make it to the Lagos and South Africa Fashion Weeks, while that hasn't happened, there's a lot of work in the capital nation to do. Throughout her life, she has been surrounded by very special people, amongst them, some with sickle cell anemia, a disease for which she decided to bring awareness. I had a dear friend that had um, sickle cell in London, and she used to have crisis, and she would call me. So I said, kid, I would go in and see her, and she would be in pain crying, and I couldn't understand it. So when I started my show in London, I did the first Black Bridal exhibition in the UK, I gave part of my proceeds to the foundation over there. And coming over here, it just so happens that my daughter's best friend has sickle cell. My son's best friend has sickle cell. And my godson has sickle cell. So it's just destiny. Part of the proceeds from the Midsummer Madness Fashion Show will be donated to Howard University Research Center for Sickle Cell Anemia. One in 13 black or African-American babies is born with sickle cell trait according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Well, that was Myra Fernandez reporting. Uh, we leave you now with the Rwandan singer Wimana Aisha, best known as Sine. Here's our music video, Mr. Lava. From all of us in Washington, have a great night. Good, good weekend to you. Welcome to English in a Minute. A corner is basically an angle where two sides meet. Boxed in a corner. Let's find out why these two are talking about corners. What's wrong? You look worried. My friend Nico quit his job, had a baby, and bought a new house all at the same time. How's that going? Not good. He's out.